We're coming to you today from a hot, steamy Columbia, Missouri to talk about how to survey parking areas. My name is Troy Balthazor. I'm an ADA specialist with the Great Plains ADA Center, part of the School of Health Professions at the University of Missouri. In general, whether it's van accessible or car accessible, you're going to need a parking space that's 96 inches wide, 8 feet, 8 feet minimum. This is measured from the center of each line on each side. Then the access aisle for a regular car accessible space will be an extra 5 feet, so 13 feet overall. For a van accessible space, you have an 8 foot access aisle. You can also use a combination to ensure that we have an equivalent outcome, such as an 11 foot space and a 5 foot access aisle. Accessible parking access aisles should be marked with a, a paint that contrasts in color from the surface. The ADA doesn't specify what color to use, so blue isn't required, yellow isn't required. The primary thing is that it contrasts from the surface so people can identify it and that the access aisle is marked in a way to discourage parking in that area. All accessible parking spaces are required to be marked with signage, one sign per space. All signage is required to have the international symbol of accessibility. In addition, if you have a van accessible space, a van accessible sign is required. The sign needs to be five feet above the surface of the parking space. So we measure from the surface of the parking space up to the bottom of that sign. So we had to do this and I'd also include the four inches that the curb creates over here to get down to the accessible parking space. In this instance, we're in an outside space, so vertical clearance isn't an issue. But in places like parking garages and other covered structures, there is a requirement that there be vertical clearance of 98 inches for vehicles to have space to get in and use that spot. So again, 98 inches of vertical clearance in covered parking situations. Surfaces within the spaces and the access aisles should be firm, stable, and slip resistant. In addition, there should be no changes in level. Up to a 1 to 48 inch slope is allowed. So when you're checking the access aisle, the parking spaces for slope, take a measurement in several spaces to determine if there are any changes in level over 1 to 48. So this access aisle is shared by two spaces. That's perfectly fine. Um, in fact, to save space, uh, businesses and state and local governments and other entities often share an access aisle between two spaces. In this case, the space is over eight feet wide, therefore accommodates a van on both sides. So we have an eight foot access aisle surrounded by two parking places that are both gonna be considered van accessible. Now this space ties in with the access aisle just about perfectly in the sense that you can get out of your parking space, get out of your parking spot and into the access aisle and within that access aisle where other cars aren't allowed to park, you have the connection to a curb ramp here. Okay, so it's not built up in the space. If it was built up in the space, it would be out of compliance because of the change in level requirements. So you want a standard curb ramp that's going to connect the parking, the accessible route, to the sidewalk leading to the entrance in this case. Another thing to take consideration when we're evaluating the access aisle is that access aisles need to extend the full length of the parking space. So the access aisle extends from the curb up to uh, the end, uh, the depth of that parking space, the full length of that space. There shouldn't be any changes in level in any of that area. Parking should be located, accessible parking should be located on the shortest accessible route to a building. In this case, we've got it located just perfectly. It's in the right spot. 
It's as close to this adjoining access aisle and sidewalk leading to the entrance compared to the rest of the parking lot. This is the closest, the shortest accessible route. Now, just a reminder, it's not always, the shortest accessible route isn't always the closest space. It means the shortest distance with an accessible route to be able to be used. So to be able to get from that parking and to be able to use an accessible route. What's the shortest distance there? In this case, it happens to be closest as well. We're encouraged not to have an accessible route that leads behind vehicles. It's also suggested a best practice is when people do have to cross a vehicular way as part of the accessible route, that that pedestrian route be marked um, with, again, some type of contrasting paint. In other words, to give a signal to both the user of where they should go, but also to other drivers to understand that that's a pedestrian walkway. Parking spaces should be designed and constructed so that vehicles, when parked in the space, cannot protrude into the accessible route or any accessible route or the access aisle. In this situation, there's no parking stopper used. So a person could, could pull up like this and be overlapping the accessible route, which is going to shut, cut down on the space available for people to pass through. Just a simple parking stop, a curb, can make a big difference in your construction on maintaining your accessible route. The number of accessible parking spaces in a parking lot is identified in Table 208.2 in the, in the 2010 Standards for Accessible Design. It identifies the number of spaces overall and then gives you a fraction of that that identifies how many spaces you need. Regardless of the number of spaces provided, the first space is always going to be van accessible, required to be van accessible. Then one in every six spaces overall, when you get in larger parking lots, one in every six is, will be required to be van accessible. And again, that means having the access aisle be a little bit wider. If an eight foot space, we'd have an eight foot access aisle. And then we're also going to be required to have van accessible signage at that spot. When determining the number of accessible spaces required based on the overall number of spaces, that determination is made on a lot by lot basis. So if you have two or three lots on a site, each lot is considered individually.